In ye olden times, game heroes were expected to do just two things. One, kick ass, and two, look stupidly ripped for the box art. Damn, Newcomb, can't you have a cheat day? But as games and the technology that drives them both evolve, certain old-school heroes have undergone a kind of emotional makeover, leaving behind their days as simple avatars in favour of depth, complexity and rich inner lives that belie their basic origins. Here then are the heroes of gaming who have undergone a radical emotional glow-up. Good for them. Along the way, beware spoilers for the following games. Sons? Sons killing their mothers? Their fathers? No. We will be the gods we choose to be. Not those who have been. Who I was is not who you be. We must be better. When you think of the God of War, emotional depth probably isn't what you think of. You think of war and Pegasuses and what you would name your Pegasus. Esmeralda is the answer. So it's fair enough that in his earliest incarnation, Kratos was a character whose emotional range stretched from violent anger to pure rage. He was raging at a series of betrayals from the highest powers on Mount Olympus, including his one-time boss, Ares. It was Ares who sneakily tricked Kratos into murdering his own wife and child, in a bid to sever his ties to the mortal world and make him a more loyal soldier. Which is the most extreme form of employee motivation. I mean, Ares, have you considered a bowl of complimentary fruit at reception? The ashes of your wife and child will remain fastened to your skin, never to be removed. And with that curse, all would know him for the beast he had become, his skin white with the ash of his dead family. These events precipitated a series of ultra-violent hack-and-slash games. which invariably ended with the horrible murder of one or more gods, including Kratos' own dad, Zeus. In these original God of Wars, the closest Kratos came to making a meaningful connection with another person was in optional sex minigames. It's okay, video games are still art. This is why we were so surprised to see Kratos re-emerge almost a decade later with a whole new outlook, along with a whole new great big bushy beard. Whereas once the ghost of Sparta was quick to anger and thirsty for slaughter, Kratos in 2018's God of War is living a quiet life of solemn reflection, having attempted to bury his violent past and start anew far from his native Greece. Find your way home. You are free. This time the death of a loved one starts a quest not of vengeance, but one to honour their last wishes and to form an emotional bond with his son Atreus. And clearly, he finds getting inside his son's head harder than getting inside a troll's. In stark contrast to the earlier God of War games, as this one unfolds, we see Kratos recoil at his son's growing desire to be a fighter and a god. We're sick of hearing about little people's little problems! We also witness his parental struggle to find the right balance between shielding Atreus from the horrors of his own past and a wish to form the kind of bond that only comes from honesty. I killed many who were deserving. And many who were not. I killed my father. Didn't tell him about the whole my body is coated in corpse ash thing. Maybe save that for when he's 16. Also didn't mention the sex minigames. Maybe save them for never. Guy, Jessica was kidnapped. Jessica? My sweetheart since childhood. The mad gear must pay. She's my friend too. Count me in. When we first met a plucky, young, denim-clad Cody Travers in Final Fight, he was a classic American hero with a very basic goal. 
After having his girlfriend kidnapped by the Mad Gear Gang, Cody made it his job to punch and kick them into oblivion. <laughs> Beat the bad guys, save the girl, have shoulders broader than a double-decker bus. Yep, sounds like an 80s action hero to me. Apart from the bit where he eats chicken off the floor. <laughs> However, later on in the series, his punching fists came back to haunt him as, in the process of saving Jessica again, he was arrested and locked away by crooked cop EDE for assault and for the crimes of ex-Mad Gear gang member Poison. This caused a breakup between him and Jessica and kept him away from his friends. So when he broke out of jail to join the Street Fighter ranks in Street Fighter Alpha 3, he was understandably distant from them and sported a rather fetching pair of long chain handcuffs. I do appreciate a good accessory. It seemed that prison really affected him, with Cody no longer seeing himself as a hero, just a fighter, and instead of reuniting with his pals, he had a bunch more punch-ups, went travelling and headed back into prison. Then in Street Fighter 4, he got bored of prison and broke out again with the promise of returning. Again. Don't get your panties in a bunch. You'll see me again soon enough. Nah, just take your time. Come back whenever you fancy. Just rebuild the wall on your way back in if you could. Despite his pal Guy saying that he vanquished a great evil after beating up genetically engineered Big Bad Seth, the emotionally broken Cody revealed a less heroic motive. <laughs> No, he was just in my way, that's all. I took him down because he was bothering me. Yes, he was a changed man, returning to prison again as he felt he had no place in the outside world. Returning? Yeah, I'll return all right. To my cell. That's where I belong. But don't worry, Cody went away and worked on himself and now he's canonically the mayor. Desk work just and also, canonically, the wrestler Kenny Omega. It's time to be the mayor. Ah, uh, Street Fighter. So you think all this talking is just holding me up? I don't know where his little jackrabbit frog legs are running him to. You'll have to ask Ms. Natlin. Thank you. I will. Our favourite Tomb Raider, Lara Croft, has been made over more times than an uncooperative contestant on Queer Eye. In the first games, Lara was cool, calm and collected, as well as more angular than a stealth aircraft, keeping her emotions under wraps and mainly speaking in pure sass. The pace is quickening now, yeah? One more crossing, child. Or do you wish to stop for tea? Oh, I think I can just about hold it together. Wouldn't want to spill it on your nice suit. At any rate. Ooh, girl! With her British accent and adventuring prowess, early Lara was pretty much a hybrid of James Bond and Indiana Jones. In the Legend reboot, however, Lara wasn't just after the next shiny artifact on her to raid list. I wouldn't take Excalibur if I didn't need it, so I hope you can forgive me. Instead, she was looking for answers over the disappearance of her mother. It was implied this was the main reason Lara went into nicking old treasures. Mother. Mother! But the biggest upheaval was in the latest Tomb Raider reboot. Here, Lara was back to just being all about the research, until she ended up in a shipwreck, kidnapped, and impaled on a metal spike. <laughs> Nothing like nearly having your kidneys shish kebobbed to give you a new perspective on things. In the recent Tomb Raiders, we've seen Lara's journey from amateur survivalist, learning how to deal with stuff life throws at her, literally, <laughs> to, well, this. <laughs> More importantly though, here we witnessed Lara accessing her feelings in a way that broke new ground for the series. Just check out the feels in this scene. You can do it, Lara. After all, you're a croft. I don't think I'm that kind of croft. Sure you are. You just don't know it yet. 
My troubles are over, my son. I don't want to go back out there. But I can't do this anymore. You are strong, Billy. We are survivors, you and I. We keep fighting even when we do not know how. You cannot help but be my son. I'm having twins, Mama. They're not born yet. I want to see them. I wanted you to see them. I miss you. The personality of BJ Blazkowicz in the early Wolfenstein games is pretty much whatever you can infer from his wiggling eyebrows in the bottom of the screen. I'm thinking excited? Nervous? Hungry? It may as well be any of those, because when allied spy BJ breaks out of prison at the start of 1992's Wolfenstein 3D, he's far more concerned with shooting Nazis in the face than he is with explaining his character motivation. <laughs> and don't get us wrong, foiling a Third Reich plot to create an army of zombie mutant super soldiers is important work, so players were understandably not fussed about getting in the head of Blazkowicz. <laughs> After all, he was busy, one, kicking ass, and two, looking muscly on the box art. And we mean real muscly! Guess it's back to the weights rack for you, Duke Nukem. But as game characters became more sophisticated, we were ready to finally find out what makes the medium's most renowned Nazi hunter tick. This is Agent BJ Blazkowicz. Wake up the director. Tell him we have to meet as soon as I land. Which is why it was a shame we didn't learn much more about him from the Naughty's Wolfenstein titles, in which BJ learned to speak, but wasn't much more than the kind of straightforward action hero you presumably immediately become when you put on this kind of leather bomber jacket. But that all changed with the more recent Wolfenstein The New Order and The New Colossus, games where we met a Blazkowicz who's all about seeing what's on the inside, and not just of Nazi soldiers. Blazkowicz in these games might be a one-man murder machine, but he's also kind and fiercely loyal to his chosen family of ragtag resistance members. That's some hot damn good banana cream pie right Max there. made! Make some! <laughs> He's also conflicted, BJ's increasingly exhausted by the seemingly endless fight that has claimed the lives of too many of his friends, but is terrified of leaving his loved ones leaderless. Not being there for you. Not rearing up our kids. That's too much to bear. The result is maybe the most striking example of emotional growth in all of gaming, and a hero story that is genuinely moving. Too, but my daddy says I'm not supposed to play with you. Which is impressive for a game in which you also fly to the planet Venus to audition in a film for Adolf Hitler. Sie spielen die Szene. Helene, zusammen mit ihm. A cold-blooded terrorist. That is what you are. With both games receiving critical praise, it's apparent that for BJ, the addition of that depth made him a better character. And a character with, and this is possibly a coincidence, much stronger jacket game. That's how it's done. You have been doomed ever since you lost the ability to love. Ha! Ah! Sarcasm! For what profit is it to a man if he gains the world and loses his own soul? Your first impression of Alucard when he's introduced in the Castlevania series is probably, hey, that's a weird name. It's Dracula backwards. Oh yeah. Your second impression when Alucard emerges from an empty cloak in Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse will be, well, not much probably, because he only gets three brief screens of dialogue. Indeed, if you didn't read the manual, you might miss the fact that Alucard is in fact Dracula's forgotten son, who now fights against his wicked father, mostly through the medium of jumping on ledges and turning into bats. But sadly, Dracula's curse doesn't give us much more insight into this mysterious character, except for an ending screen that boldly explains, quote, 
The battle was won by Trevor and Alucard, but Alucard feels guilty because he killed his real father. Oh my god, and Trevor, backwards, is Rovert! Did I find a clue? Yes, you found a clue. Yes! Fans may have felt a bit sorry for Alucard and his striking lack of closure on what is clearly a very complicated relationship with his blood-sucking dad, but emotional development would follow seven years later in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I was hoping we would not see each other again. I can't allow you to leave here, father. Symphony of the Night promoted Alucard to protagonist and features an impassioned showdown with his father who is bent on destroying the human race who so callously burned his beloved Lisa, Alucard's mother, as a witch. Think you I would forget such a thing? No, but neither do I seek revenge against them. Deep. And rather than facing off as simple enemies, in Symphony of the Night, Dracula would rather be on the same side as his long lost son. And join me in remaking this world! Whoa! Dad, how about we start with a fishing trip and then we'll see about that whole remaking the world business. Of course, peace with Dracula is not feasible and a fight to the death ensues, ending with a scene that packs a surprising sensitivity and nuance considering everyone is basically shouting everything. Tell me, what, what were Lisa's last words? She said, do not hate humans. If you cannot live with them, then at least do them no harm, for theirs is already a hard lot. She also said to tell you that she would love you for all of eternity. Lisa, forgive me. Farewell, my son. Ow, my heart. Damn it, closure. Who, who, who's there? I'm here to save you. You're the DARPA chief, Donald Anderson, right? You're here to save me, huh? What's your outfit? I'm the pawn they sent here to save your worthless butt. In the 90s, you could get away with a character whose defining personality trait was owning a cool headband. And thus, in the Metal Gear Solid series, Solid Snake became a solid favorite, thanks to his cool headband and a few quips. I wasn't able to read the future. The strong man doesn't need to read the future. He makes his own. However, there are a few complications, or should we say clone plications? Don't ever say clone plications. <laughs> okay. Yes, in a genetic puzzle trickier than a crossword in a wind tunnel, there are a whole bunch of iterations of Solid Snake, mainly because he is a clone of Big Boss. By the time Metal Gear Solid 5 came around, Big Boss's mind was the mental template for Venom Snake, the main protagonist. I have no idea what's happening with the snakes anymore, but I do enjoy Fulton ballooning everything. <coughs> Whee! The important thing is to keep in mind that technically these characters are all clones of the same person, and the hero in the 1998 game didn't have a huge amount of depth, except literally when you put him in a big box. But in Metal Gear 5 The Phantom Pain, your hero was less a secret agent, more a war-torn fighter who suddenly sounded like Jack Bauer. It's your fault! They're dead because of you! What? He's right. Yes, long-running Metal Gear voice actor David Hayter, whose snake voice was more animated and action hero-esque, was replaced by big league actor Kiefer Sutherland, who perfected a nuanced and tortured version of the character. Which goes some way to explain this scene wherein Venom Snake mourns some fallen comrades in his own moving yet messy way. be with you. Plant your roots in me. Snake, have you been talking to Kratos? Look, clearly no character in the Super Mario universe is a model of emotional maturity. I mean, except for Chain Chomp, who clearly has his shit together. You're right, Chain Chomp. All I need is to be me. Now, although Luigi of Mario Bros. fame won't be running any self-improvement seminars anytime soon, he has undoubtedly shown more emotional evolution than any of his cartoonish cohorts. <laughs> Namely, he's gone from having basically no personality to being scared all the time. <laughs> what? 
Fear is an emotion. Introduced way back in 1983, Luigi was originally designed to be nothing more than a multiplayer Mario in different colours, so that younger brothers and sisters could join their siblings in the arcades, but crucially in a way that left nobody in any doubt as to who the main player was. In the decades that followed, Luigi became a smidge taller than Mario and capable of jumping higher. But the real breakthrough came in 2001, when Luigi first walked up to a mansion he'd won in a competition that he didn't even enter, and became so afraid it seemed like his heart would give out. <laughs> and it turned out that seeing Luigi afraid for his life, well, we just bloody loved it. Since then, Luigi has become a canonical coward in the pantheon of literary cowards, much like Shakespeare's Falstaff or Scooby-Doo, whose defining character trait is that almost everything causes him to tremble with fear. Not a great life for Luigi, but look at it this way. How much of Mario, Bowser or Peach really developed over the years? Luigi may be scared all the time, but hey, at least he's feeling something, man. And how much courage does it really take for Mario to defeat his foes when he's not afraid of anything? It's Luigi, who overcomes his terror to win the day, who's the real hero. Nintendo gets it, having heartily embraced Luigi's evolving character, famously declaring 2013 to be the year of Luigi. A move that really paid off when that fiscal year, Nintendo lost $456 million. Damn, Luigi. <laughs> So there were some of the characters that were a little bit basic to begin with, but through time and a lot of effort and love by their creators have turned into fully blossomed characters who we all dearly love and just like, just giving them beards, that usually helps as well, definitely. <laughs> if you enjoyed the video, do give us a thumbs up, um, pop a comment down below. If you can think of any other characters that have drastically changed over the years and like become way more multi-dimensional and stuff. Uh, but also, you should check out some videos. Uh, outside Xbox have looked at games where all the endings were bad. So, you know, if you want some more emotions, go watch that and feel sad. And then, uh, if you want to see very, very one-dimensional characters that only ask you to race things, check out this video that we did. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Bye!